Hi, and welcome today to the next webinar in our Plante Presents Global Plant Science Talk Series. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Today, we have a special event in this series. Our title is Creating Crops for the Future, Challenges, Technology, and Sustainable Solutions. This is a special event that's hosted by the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis and the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Plant Energy Biology. We're really excited to have you all here. But before we get started and I turn it over to John, I'd like to go over just a few technical details to make sure you get the most out of today's webinar. If you're having trouble connecting or if you need to leave early, just know that a recording of this webinar will be made available along with all associated materials within a few days. Today's talks will each be 20 minutes each. As you listen to each talk today, please add your questions for our panelists in the Zoom question and answer Q&A section. Putting your questions here make it, makes it easier for our moderate, moderator to navigate and share them with our panelists. Feel free to also use the chat area to introduce yourselves and ask any technical difficulties that you might have. Professor John Evans is with us today to introduce today's topic, our speakers, and to moderate today's sessions. Dr. Evans is a co-leader of the ARC Center of Excellence for Translational photosynthesis, which focuses on energy capture. Dr. Evans is internationally renowned for his research on photosynthesis in relation to nitrogen, light, and leaf anatomy, and understanding the CO2 diffusion pathways within leaves. His international research impact was recognized by election to the Australian Academy of Sciences in 2013. He's also a monitoring editor for the ASPB journal Plant Physiology and is on the editorial board of Plants and Cell, Plant Cell and Environment. Thanks, John. I'm going to turn it over to you to moderate the session and uh, say a little bit more about your, your program. Right. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's wonderful that uh, Plante has provided us this, uh, this platform for our event today. And thank you for uh, rising to all the technical challenges that may arise today. I'd also like to thank Mary Williams and Ben Swessinger for making uh, it possible for us to um, put the, the uh, event here onto Plante. So this week, Australians are celebrating the history, culture and achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And although our event is virtual, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I am broadcasting from today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have nurtured a connection to country with a profound sense of responsibility to the natural world for more than 60,000 years. Secondly, I'd like to recognize that in many parts of the world, we pause in silence at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month to mark remembrance of the end of World War I in 1918. Now, 2020 marks 50 years since Norman Borlaug received the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the Green Revolution. In 2005, Borlaug stated that world food supply needed to double by 2050 and that 85% of this increase needed to occur through increased yield rather than increasing cultivated area. He stressed that the focus should be on disease resistance, of course that was his passion, and the transfer of wheat proteins, gliadins and glutenins into rice and maize to improve their nutritional value. He recognized the need to utilize the power of genetic engineering in order to achieve this urgent challenge. So today's event features three eminent speakers who will address the challenges we face and the technology and sustainable solutions for creating crops for the future. Despite the disruption to life this year from COVID-19, one positive consequence is that this event is occurring live through the internet, enabling participation from an international audience. I'd like to welcome you all, whatever your time zone, and encourage you to fill in the brief poll so we um, had a feel for the audience. And after each talk, we're going to allow questions. And then finally, after the three talks have been completed, we'll um, have a more general question and answer session. So please uh, enter your questions through the Q&A um, chat box, uh, and I'll coordinate this and pose the questions to each of our speakers. So today we're going to begin um, with Pamela, 
Pamela Ronald, Distinguished Professor at the Department of Plant Pathology and the Genome Center, University of California, Davis. She's also a key scientist at the Joint Bioenergy Institute and a faculty affiliate at the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University. She has recently been honored with 2020 World Agriculture Food Prize Laureate Award by the Global Confederation of Higher Education Associations for Agricultural and Life Sciences for her lifetime achievement in agriculture. Her research uses genetic techniques to understand the plant response to infection and tolerance to environmental stress. Her talk is titled Improving Food Security for the World's Poorest Farmers. Rice Genetics and the Future of Food. So welcome, Pamela. Hello, everyone. Thank you, John, very much um, for hosting this session. And before I start, let me ask if you can see my screen. OK. Well, I am very happy to be here and to see my colleagues virtually and to, to join with uh, many of you from uh, around the world. And of course, we know agriculture is a major contributor to climate change, something like 33% of greenhouse gas emissions for, are from agriculture. But it's also a victim of climate change. As the climate changes, it's more challenging for farmers to produce food efficiently. And finally, it's also a solution to climate change. So if we can farm more efficiently, if we can reduce agricultural waste and food waste, um, we can really help be, be part of the solution. So, uh, of course, an important goal of plant biology research, which, which I'll give you a couple examples of today, is, is to develop crops that can survive under stressful conditions. Um, so I work on rice, which is a staple food uh, for half the world's population. And I wanted to talk about work in my lab and, and with my collaborators over the years for engineering resistance and to disease and tolerance to environmental stress, which are, are two major aspects of engineering crops for resilience. So I have, um, I started my career working on bacterial blight of rice, which is a serious um, bacterial pathogen of rice. And what you see here are rice leaves that are infected with Xanthomonas oryzae, Pathovar oryzae. And the yellow pigment is, that you see is the bacteria uh, with the yellow pigment oozing out of the leaf. And if this uh, disease uh, is not uh, managed or controlled, which is challenging to do, farmers can lose up to 50% of their yield. So plant biologists have long turned to wild species and ancient varieties to identify um, genes encoding traits that can confer tolerance to stresses. And um, a number of years ago now, scientists uh, discovered that one strain of Oryzae longestaminata in Mali uh, conferred ro robust resistance to this bacterial infection. And here you see a scientist um, holding up Oryzae longestaminata, which is a weedy species that's not used as a food, but it does, it did have a very important source of a gene called Xanthomonas 21 or XA21. So uh, this gene conferred resistance to all strains of the bacteria that had so far been characterized. And I show a picture here of Gerda Kusch, who is a longtime colleague and esteemed scientist. Um, he spent most of his, his career at UC Davis um, and the International Rice Research Institute, where he did many pioneering studies. And he's considered the father of uh, the Green Revolution rice because of, of, of his work introducing many important, uh, agronomically important traits into rice, including um, uh, dwarfism genes. So Gurdjieff uh, shared with me his knowledge on the XA21 trait and um, gave me a bag of seed when I was a um, postdoc. And I started to work with my colleagues to try to isolate this gene using map-based cloning. And so on the top, you see two rice leaves that have been infected with uh, the bacteria. And you can see that the bacteria causes long lesions down the leaf. 
Now on the bottom are rice plants that we engineered with the XA21 gene. And you can see that even after inoculation, the plants are very resistant to bacterial infection. Now this was quite exciting because at the time, there were, we were, scientists were only beginning to identify genes that conferred resistance. And um, so the structure was quite interesting. It encoded a, an immune receptor kinase. So it had an extracellular leucine root repeat domain and an intracellular kinase domain. So we could immediately hypothesize then that <clears throat> perhaps the extracellular domain could recognize a conserved um, pathogen molecule and that a resistance response would be transduced through the kinase. And around the same time, there was some very interesting receptors identified in, in flies and mouse, which were the toll and toll-like receptors, which conferred uh, an immune response to infectious disease. And you can see that the structures were very similar between XA21 toll and TLR4. And they also had a very similar kinase domain. So during this time, discoveries in uh, many labs around the world, including um, Jeff Ellis in, in Australia, really began to give us the picture that genes for resistance to microbes were highly conserved, uh, not only among plant species, but also in animal species as well. Now we've spent a number of years um, very interested in trying to understand what molecule is recognized by XA21. But first I wanted to just um, touch on um, the incredible growth and in, in more than 25 years of discoveries in this field. And I sort of put XA21 down here about the time Jeff Ellis isolated the L6 gene. Um, and there, it's color coded because there's several classes of these immune receptors. And um, we now have um, actually quite a bit off the chart number of, of resistance genes isolated. And of course, importantly, we are understanding the ligands that are bound by these receptors and also the mechanism of action. So you can see that um, we have much more knowledge now and, and, uh, and a plenty of areas of innovation and um, strategic challenges ahead. So I wanted to briefly mention that we have been able to isolate the ligand for XA21. And this is work carried out by Rory Pruitt, um, uh, Ben Schwesinger, and others in my lab. And we isolated a small molecule called RAX-X that's secreted from the bacteria. And it's a sulfated molecule. And so what's interesting about this is this bacterial uh, molecule binds directly to the XA21 receptor and triggers a number of immune responses, which are listed here, leading to resistance. So we now, um, just to bring you up to date, we're trying to understand what is the function of this small molecule in the microbial pathogen. We don't have um, everything figured out by any means, um, but we do know that this microbial protein RAX-X is similar to a peptide hormone in plants called pep plant peptide containing sulfated tyrosine PSY1. And you can see the similarity between PSY and RAX-X uh, in the bottom of the slide. And we do know a lot about the synthesis and secretion of the small molecule. Uh, we know where it's cleaved. So it has a very long leader, which is shown here. It's cleaved, and then you can see the tyrosine is highlighted, highlighted that's sulfated. And interestingly, we know that a, a short reason, a region can promote root growth. So it has a very robust effect on plant growth and development. And so this is the peptide hormone type activity. And we know that just the addition of three amino acid is sufficient to uh, convert this microbial molecule into activating XA21 mediated immunity. Uh, this shows you the peptide hormone function. We've been able to show that RAX-X um, is a functional mimic of the rice PSY1 peptide. And what you see here on the left 
uh, our rice seedlings that have um, been grown hydroponically and we've added uh, a synthetic peptide because we've been able to synthesize and show the synthetic peptide is, is active. So both PSY1, which is the plant peptide hormone, and RAXX have very similar biological activities where they cause this very long root growth. We also know it causes um, enhanced uh, elongation, not only in the roots, but uh, elongating cells as well in the, the shoots. So from this, we have um, shown that RAXX can act as an immunogen. In other words, this is essentially what I showed you before, that xanthomonas will secrete the small peptide. And when it's recognized by plants with XA21, you get this robust immune response. So that's kind of a classic, our classic understanding of resistance genes and their microbial ligands. But we also have shown that xanthomonas um, can also uh, secrete RAXX and that it can act as a virulence factor. And so, when xanthomonas strains that are lacking RAXX are less virulent. And so we hypothesize that we don't know what is the exact function of this RAXX peptide, but we hypothesize that it probably binds a, um, uh, the PSY receptor and that somehow it triggers growth and development that enhances virulence. And so we're now trying to understand what that function of precise function of that molecule is. Um, and so this is our, our model to finish the section that, uh, that the plant PSY produces a small peptide hormone. Uh, we hypothesize there is a receptor for this hormone. And we do know that addition of this hormone can have a very strong effect on growth and development. And we hypothesize that xanthomotis produces a mimic of this plant peptide hormone perhaps binds the very same receptor and triggers um, some sort of growth and development that will allow it to facilitate infection. Then um, we imagine that an XA21 evolved to specifically recognize this virulence factor. And so now upon recognition, <clears throat> the plant confers an immune response. So we now know that immune receptors in plants and animals are very similar. And we've been able to show that the bacterial pathogen secretes a sulfate peptide that binds to the receptor. RAXX serves as a microbial virulence factor. And then just getting back to the theme of today about how we can engineer resilience, there's a lot of interest in the plant biology community to take what we know about plant microbe interactions and try to engineer receptors that recognize a particular microbial molecule. So one thing we're interested in is to see if we can engineer the XA21 receptor with broader spectrum resistance so it recognizes other types of um, microbial molecules. I wanted to uh, briefly mention the work um, with my colleagues on engineering tolerance to environmental stress. We do know that as the climate changes, that we're predicted to have not only more droughts, but more flooding. And so these kids in Bangladesh are walking through their family's flooded field. And although rice grows well in standing water, rice plants that are submerged for more than three days will die. And so in the center of this field, these kids and their families won't be able to harvest any grain in this part of the field. This is a particular problem in Eastern India, Bangladesh, where 25% of the world's rice is grown. It's, it's flood prone. It's estimated that 4 million tons of rice, uh, enough to feed 30 million people, is lost every year till flooding. Now, scientists at the International Rice Research Institute had identified an ancient rice variety that's highly tolerant to submergence. And it was found in Eastern India. And they tried to breed this flood tolerant trait into rice varieties, um, but they were unable to develop varieties that the farmers would embrace. So, so typically what we think about is that uh, sort of conventional breeding, not only do you bring in your trait of interest, but you drag in other traits that um, bring down uh, the yield or the taste or the flavor. So um, about you know, 20 years now, my colleague David McKill,
asked me if I'd like to um, join their project. They had mapped um, a submergence tolerant trait in, in a land, land race from Eastern India. And so we thought if we could isolate that gene, we could either introduce it into rice varieties grown by farmers, either by marker assisted breeding or genetic engineering. So we were successful in isolating the gene. And this shows you an experiment from my lab. So on the left is a conventional rice variety that's been um, grown for two weeks, submerged for two weeks, and then allowed to recover from the flood. And it does not do very well. But in contrast, the plants that we engineered with the sub 1A gene um, that we identified through map-based cloning has robust resistance to flooding. So this was su super exciting um, that we were able to identify a single gene with this robust effect. But the next step, um, importantly, was to see if this would be useful to breeders. And this is the, uh, oh, so I want to first tell you briefly about the mechanism of action. And this is a, a tremendous uh, work um, led by Julie Bailey Sayers and others. So it's a very talented group of researchers. And they begin, begin to uncover the mechanism with which sub-1 locus enables plants to endure complete submergence for prolonged periods. So submergence creates a low oxygen environment and the accumulation of ethylene. In the absence of sub-1A, plant elongation signaling pathways mediated by the plant hormone GA cause the plants to grow rapidly, which depletes their carbohydrate reserves and the plants die. Now in the presence of sub-1A, ethylene activates the sub-1A transcription factor. A low oxygen environment stabilizes the ethylene responsive transcription factors, ER, ERF66 and ERF67 which are direct transcriptional targets of sub-1A, and they are upregulated uh, up by sub-1A. Now, ERF66 and ERF67 directly or indirectly activate expression of submergence responsive genes. Sub-1A also downregulates carbohydrate metabolism and induces ethanolic fermentation, and it also downregulates the GA signaling by um, and so the resulting reduction in cell elongation and carbohydrate breakdown conserves the shoot meristem and energy reserves until the flood subsides. And together, these traits contribute to submergence tolerance. So um, Dave McKill carried out um, four years of field trials with this new variety. And so I want you to watch this four month time lapse video. It shows a sub one variety developed at the International Rice Research Institute using marker assisted breeding. So on the left is the sub one variety and on the right is the conventional variety. They both grow very well. And then a flood is applied for 17 days. And what you're watching here is the recovery after the flood, after the water has been removed. And so you can see that the sub one variety um, does very, very well. And in these field trials, um, breeders were able to harvest threefold more grain. So this is a great movie to show um, people that are not plant biologists because they can begin to understand the power of genetics and why we're so interested in isolating these types of genes. And this is um, the whole team uh, visited farmers in India and Bangladesh. And this is one of the images that was taken on that trip. So Swarna is a, a mega variety grown by farmers um, in, in large regions in India and Bangladesh. And on the right is Swarna sub one. So the variety developed at the International Rice Research Institute. And this is just natural field conditions. And there's been a tremendous uh, flooding every year. And what farmers found was a 60% yield advantage in the Swarna sub one lines. Now, who benefits? So this is something that comes up a lot. I think when we're talking about sustainable agriculture, we need to think about um, socioeconomic effects as well as environmental effects. And so this was a study carried out by Kyle Emmerich and colleagues at UC Berkeley. And so he asked this question and what he did was he went into um, some villages in Eastern India, which you see on the lower right of the screen. And each dot represent one of the 128 villages that he looked at. 
And um, the elevation gradient is shown here. So the more mountainous region is in dark red. And he had uh, two groups of farmers, some that wanted to try to grow Swarna sub one and sub that, some that just kept Swarna and there was no cost for participating in this experiment. And he then was able to see what, what kind of yield and he was able to um, confirm results of Dave McKillen colleagues that Swarna sub one conferred a massive, uh, in this case, a 45% yield advantage. And um, not surprisingly, he found that low-lying areas were more prone to flooding. But what's interesting to know is that these uh, flood-prone areas are heavily occupied by people belonging to lower caste social group. So these are the, the very poorest farmers in the world who've been farming these flood-prone lands for generation. And the conclusion from this study was that the sub one uh, variety disproportionately benefits the world's poorest farmers. So this was a really exciting project to participate in. It was very international. And um, we, uh, the Erie received support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to bulk up and distribute the seed. Last year, 6 million farmers grew sub one rice. So I wanted to just end here and um, just mention, so rice is not only a staple food, but it's a tractable model for genetic studies. So it's a fantastic uh, crop to work with uh, for those of you that are interested. And um, I think that studying plant microbe interactions leads to knowledge that is really beginning to be used to develop strategies to engineer resistance to disease, which will become increasingly important and as we've long known that we need um, genetic diversity because this genetic diversity carries genes that have very important traits. And so, for example, uh, both genes that I talked about were identified from either a land race or a wild species. And scientists are increasingly mining these genomes. There's 3,000 rice genomes now, and um, many wild species have been sequenced. And that is being very useful for um, identifying genes of interest and also for there's it's much more efficient to bring these genes into plants. So these advancements really offer new opportunities uh, for young scientists and it's a, a really exciting time um, in plant biology and I'd like to thank um, the many contributors uh, to this project and the agencies that have supported this project. So thank you very much. And um, I think uh, if there's time, I'll take a couple of questions. Otherwise we can wait until after all the speakers talk. Well, thank you, Pamela. That was a wonderful introductory uh, lecture that you've delivered um, and clearly uh, shows why you're such a worthy uh, recipient of the, of the uh, agriculture prize. So I've got. To, I've just been asked to turn my camera on. There you are. So thank you, Pamela. That was a wonderful introduction. I didn't say the uh, image of rice behind me is actually taken at the International Rice Research Institute, uh, just showing some of the genetic variability that uh, is available to to plant breeders. Well, so far we've had. Uh, oh, just another question's come up, but I'll put the first question that came up, which was from Kathleen Heffron, and she asked, "Could you add an animal um, receptor?" Uh, for uh, a pathogen to a plant? And would that be a useful strategy? Well, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't even know if it's been tried, but so TLR4, for example, recognizes lipopolysaccharide. And um, I think until recently, there wasn't such a receptor in plants. Although I think now that there is an LPS receptor that's been identified in plants. Um, so that's an example where you might think of um, something like that being able to work. Of course, there, there need to be some engineering, um, both in terms of the LPS from the path, the plant pathogens likely different than the animal pathogens. You may need to tinker around a little bit with the, the downstream signaling. But um, yeah, I, I think that's something that, uh, that could be tried. Thank you. We have now a question also from Mohammed uh, Mahmoud, who was asking about positive and negative impacts of introducing a sub one uh, transcription factor with particularly respect to phytopathogens. 
So um, thank you for that question. What, so the scientists at the International Rights Research Institute did, did do a number of studies testing to see if the sub-1 variety had any alterations in agronomic characteristics compared to the, uh, the conventional variety. And they found that in the absence of flooding, there really wasn't any sort of yield changes or flavor changes, um, no changes in the, the pest or pathogen populations um, before or after flooding. Um, so, so far, they, it, it seems to be um, no, no negative effects. And so you can kind of think it as the whole, you can add a sub one A gene, but it's a master transcriptional regulator. So the whole pathway is really turned off until uh, flooding occurs and then the system is turned on. So um, in the absence of flooding, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see um, other, other changes. And so, so far, um, the farmers that are growing the rice have been very, very happy with it, um, I believe. And it's, it's, it's been widely adopted in, in Bangladesh and, and India. All right, we have a, another question, uh, this time from Peter Ryan, uh, the president of the Australian Society of Plant Scientists. Uh, he asked, does PSY work in other cereal species to promote root growth? Aha, uh -huh. well, yes, I think so. So um, we have uh, shown, and other people have shown, that this PSY peptide family is present in virtually all plant species. And there are a number of variants. So rice, for example, has eight uh, very closely related PSY peptides. The receptor has not been isolated, but the peptide family is present in, in other plants and other cereals. And in, in fact, we have done some experiments. We know that the rice peptide and the Rabidopsis peptide are essentially interchangeable. So the rice peptide works on a Rhabdopsis peptide works on rice um, to uh, cause root growth. And maize, for example, also has many of these peptides, although we haven't done that precise experiment. We've also looked at tomatoes. So, so, so we right now we think that probably it's a very conserved uh, peptide receptor family that, that is essential for function. So probably most cereals, all cereals would have this system. scroll down. Oh, so uh, just following on from that, um, Michael Georgievic asks, what's the concentration of peptide used that needed to promote root growth? Ah, I don't have that number on the, on the top of my head. So I, I'm not even good at, I'm not even going to guess. Very small amounts. <laughs> All right. So before I just move on to the second talk, there's also an anonymous uh, question about uh, a, a way for a young and penniless scientist to obtain your nice collection of rice kitaki FN mutants um, without oh, paying okay. too much. I, okay, so I didn't talk about this. I, I was thinking about it, but then I took it out. I didn't think we had enough time. But we do have a fast neutron mutagenized kitaki mutant population. So we have about 3,200 mutants. They've been sequenced to 45-fold depth. And we would love for you to, any of you, to use some of these rice mutants uh, projects funded by the National Science Foundation. So if you go to KitBase, K-I-T-B-A-S-E, um, I think it's, um, just Google KitBase UC Davis, up will pop the seed ordering page. And uh, we'd be very happy to, to send you some mutants. And I, I'll put that in the chat I'll, uh, for people to take a look at the website. That's brilliant. Thank you, Pamela. So there are more questions coming through and no doubt uh, people will will add keep adding to that. But I think I'll hold further questions until until the end. Um, and so now we'll move on to our second speaker. Thank you. So our second speaker is uh, Professor Harvey Miller. He is from the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Plant Energy Biology. And Professor Miller is currently an ARC Australian Laureate Fellow at the University of Western Australia researching dynamic proteins for future nutritious crops, an approach that continues on from his previous work building plant proteome databases. His talk's entitled Plant Energy Biology, 
altering energy use efficiency in plants to enhance crop growth and yield. Over to you, Harvey. Thanks very much, John. Hopefully people can see my slides and, uh, and also hear me. Um, so what I wanted to do was to take this opportunity uh, to talk about plant energy biology, which in our view is really a fusion of biology and engineering principles as a way of thinking about how to alter the energy use efficiency in plants to enhance crop growth and yield. So I want to introduce some of those concepts behind that, but I also want to introduce a consortium of Australian researchers from four universities and their partners who've been doing this and try and provide some examples of that, of that work in action. So I think it's clear to all of us that uh, the plant energy uh, plays a really pivotal role in our global ecosystem. Um, and seemingly there's almost an unending uh, ability or supply of energy from the sun and from atmospheric gases um, that we could use through plants to build food and fuel and feed and fabrication materials. But we know, of course, that there are limitations and those limitations come in the form of the, uh, the nutrient resources, many of which are mined or have a large uh, energy requirement to make, um, which are required for those plants. And it's also limited by the fact that uh, with changing climates, with water supply, with extremes in the environment and the amount of arable land, um, this is also a major impediment. And all of these things are really showcased in Australia, which is really a land of, of extremes of these particular components. So I guess in our view, there's really kind of, I guess, three points we have to consider when we think about where we are now and what the future might actually demand of us. Uh, so one of those is certainly uh, this yield requirement, the requirement to feed predicted 2050 populations. Um, it's larger than our current rate of improvement, as, as Pam said. Um, and so we're facing a situation where we have a rate of improvement. Um, what we need for the future is going to out outstrip that rate of improvement. And often it's easy to see a gap between uh, two lines in these sorts of graphs. But it's important to realize that when we get to 2050, that gap between two lines is actually the food for maybe something like 2 billion people. So it really has an impact right at the level of individuals and the scale of the individual problem that we have. The other thing, of course, is that uh, these world averages actually hide problems with climate variability, which are impacting yield in very specific countries. So overall, we see this increase, but it needs to be faster. But when you look at individual countries, and I'll just take Australia as an example, our variation and, and droughts and climate issues in Australia mean that our contribution to that is highly variable. And this is gonna be different for each country and it's gonna impact on the choices that different countries make as to what they're gonna be able to do to sustain their agriculture into the future. The other, of course, really important point that was raised right at the beginning by John when he's talking about um, Borg's vision was that we don't have any more arable land for expansion. So while the populations increased over the last 100 years and, and into the, to the 150 years, actually in the next 50 years, we'll need to harvest as much cereal grain, for example, as we've been able to produce since the beginning of agriculture, just because of this growth in population. So this is really an unprecedented need for new efficiency gains. So if you think about um, land and you think about a football field, then in 1900, pretty much every man, woman and child on the planet, there was a football field of arable land that could produce food for them. By 1960, we were sharing that football field with somebody else. Um, today, there's probably four people on that football field. And if we think about our children and grandchildren in 2050, then we're probably talking about five or six people on that football field. So, can yield really be improved through efficiency gains to solve this problem? And I guess the thing that we focused on is the fact that only about 25% of the carbon captured by elite crops um, is harvested. And actually there's much less than that under harsh and changing conditions. So it seems like there are efficiency gains that could be made. So from our view, looking at this, changing that balance between photosynthetic carbon gain and respiratory loss lies really at the heart of this efficiency question and the efficiency increases that could be obtained. So that, if you think about it as a pie, that 25% is effectively the biomass which is harvested. There's another, there's another chunk of that pie, which is the non-harvested biomass. 
But then there's also the, the, the losses of carbon that happen through respiration. And that's respiration which is required for growth and also respiration that's required um, for maintenance. So really changing the efficiency is thinking about how we change the proportions of those pies. We can increase photosynth photosynthesis and increase um, harvest just by increasing photosynthetic gains. Um, but if we don't do that in combination with what's happening in, in losses, um, then we'll find that we haven't actually changed the pie. We've simply changed the sizes of some of those sectors. And that's probably not ultimately an efficiency gain for plant biology as a whole. So really, if you think about um, those parts of the pie, um, they're a bit of a black box. What's actually underneath them? What are the biological mechanisms that could actually change the size of those pies or the proportion of those pies? We have to consider this both in terms of the genetics, and obviously we have to consider this in terms of whether or not through the environment and through management, these things can actually impact right up from the cell up to the level of fields and, and the planet. So we're interested in understanding what these biological mechanisms could be um, that could underlie the large scale changes in efficiency limits. And then ultimately thinking about, could you actually draw solutions from molecular processes that can break some of these efficiency barriers? So over the last 15 years, uh, plant energy biology, um, as, as John introduced, has been a research center uh, running in Australia. And this is a fusion of scientists from across the country trying to address this together in a collective way. So the fundamental question that we've been asking is how do plants actually regulate their energy in harsh and changing environments? And this is really, from our perspective, a question of the rate of energy conversion processes. We can think about the energy that's gained through photosynthesis, and we can see that that's going to vary depending on the environment. So whether that's a change in temperature, a change in nutrient concentration or water quantity, it's going to vary. But that's not actually um, yield because energy is actually used inside of plants for a whole range of different processes, which are essential. So energy is used in gaining the nutrients that the plant needs to grow. It's used in stress and defense. It's used in, in iron gradients across cells. It's used in protein turnover for the making and breaking of the many proteins that make up the plant and its functions. And it's also used in moving things from source tissues to sink tissues, ultimately, so we can harvest them. So really, the, that growth and yield potential in energy terms is this difference between the energy gain curves and these energy use curves. And so really, what we're talking about is changing um, the uh, relationship between these two curves, and in that way, being able to actually change growth and yield potential in plant systems. So our approach to doing this has been, I guess, almost an engineering approach. And that is to define, well, what actually needs changing as we study metabolic models, as we think about signaling networks and the way in which they respond to the environment, can we find things that can actually be changed and need changing in order to alter this efficiency? The next thing we have to ask is where they actually need to be, because just expressing something everywhere in a plant doesn't necessarily yield a result. And so we have these concepts of gatekeeper cells, specific cell types that specific activities might be beneficial to plants. And we also have to consider the transport and storage of things across a plant system. And then the last question is, how could you actually use that information and knowledge of where something needs to be to actually alter it in a way um, that works and that can uh, operate in the environment. So I just want to give you a couple of examples of ways which we attempted to do this and show you how far we've got at this question of, can you take an individual mechanism and alter growth or yield in the process? So first off, I want to talk about tuning energy systems in plant cells for response and resilience. So one really interesting aspect of how organelles function in plants is that when you have um, examples of cyto cytoplasmic male sterility, these are often associated with mitochondrial dysfunctions. So the dysfunctions in the way that respiration actually works. And if you can genetically use these dysfunctions and link them to restorers of fertility, then you can develop uh, hybrid systems that can work at a genetic level 
and you can deploy these in crops. So we've been uh, very active through the work of Ian Small's group, actually looking at PPR restorers of fertility. So these are proteins that, uh, that bind RNA and he's been able to match um, the uh, cytoplasmic mouse sterility systems with these restorer systems to build the potential for wheat hybrid systems that could be used commercially. He's also been doing lots of modeling to show that energy use efficiency really underpins uh, the hybrid vigor that we see in the plants that result. Uh, so the impact of this through collaborations um, with Lemograin has been the development of commercial hybrid systems for wheat, which in the future could be enabling really step changes of 10 to 15% through hybrid vigor. And this, is, this could be applied to wheat in a way that hasn't been in the past. Second example I'd like to give is about a phosphatase called SAL1. So SAL1 is a phosphatase that degrades a, uh, a small molecule which is um, a byproduct of sulfur metabolism called PAP. So it was discovered by, by Barry Poxon's group in our center that, uh, that this chloroplast SAL1, which degrades PAP, is actually a negative regulator of stress-induced transcriptional responses. So we know that plants actually grow slowly um, under drought conditions and they have slower photosynthesis. And if you make and the maintenance of, of high PAP levels in cell one deficient lines can actually promote uh, tissue viability under water stress, enabling drought tolerance. And you can see an example there with the, the mutant in Arabidopsis of this particular gene. Barry's group's been working um, in collaboration with our Grain Research Development Corporation in Australia to transfer this capability into wheat and knockout of just one of the seven SAL1 genes in wheat uh, has been shown to cause significant increases in wheat yield in multiple drought affected field trials. And this work is ongoing. The last thing I wanted to, to say on this, this particular area is um, as we've been better understanding energy use efficiency measures in plants, as we understand how metabolism is operating together to actually increase the efficiency of metabolic processes and energy use, um, we can apply this in a variety of different systems. So in collaborations with, uh, with CIMIT, um, looking at field trials in Mexico, but also Australian uh, high yield wheat lines, um, we've been able to look at the variation in respiration rates and the alteration in key metabolic pathways. Um, and using a combination of genomics, uh, photosynthesis and respiratory measurements, proteomics and metabolomics, we've been using this through machine learning to actually predict crop yield based on energy use efficiency, recognizing that metabolic pathways can therefore be used to optimize for yield. So we have some good ideas now of how to do that and the machine learning capability um, to make these measurements. And we're now actually using these in high throughput uh, phenotyping trials to actually look through biochemical analysis and hyperspectral imaging at field trials and predict yield and energy use efficiency in wheat um, through these measures. But it's not just on the side of thinking about the energy generation systems that we're operating. We're also trying to think about the transport and storage costs and how we might be able to improve specific cells for whole plant performance in this way. So to give you again a couple of examples of what we've been doing and where it's been um, going to date. So one of the areas that we've been actively working in has been uh, working through uh, Rana Munza's group, her activities and the collaborations that she has across our centre, um, looking at transporters for sodium. So NAX1 and NAX2, um, they're uh, sodium selective uniporters and they unload sodium from the xylem in roots. Um, so Rana discovered that um, there are these ancestral NAX genes that, that do this and they can prevent a lot of sodium transport into leaves. And we know that when that sodium gets into leaves, that that salinity damages photosynthesis and to a degree also respiration in plants and reduces plant yield. So excluding sodium from the cost from the shoot can actually limit those costs to the energy system. And Rana and her collaborators have been showing that there is an impact here um, when you look at the whole plant level. So in Durham wheat, they've been able to show they can get a 25% increase in yield um, by expressing these next transporters. 
And there can be a 10% increase in, uh, in bread wheat yields as well on salt affected land. And that's been shown in multiple sites. Another area we've been working in is looking at uh, phosphate acquisition and use in plants. So as we know, phosphate use efficiency is a key target for crop improvement. Um, and really there's cell specific expression which underpins this phosphate use efficiency. So Jim Whelan and his group at La Trobe University um, have been uh, discovering that there are calcium sensors and also signal recognition proteins, which are differentially expressed in the roots of plants and they're strong negative regulators of phosphate acquisition. And they've been able to show in model systems so far um, that null mutants of these can actually achieve a 50% increase in biomass um, compared to wild type under phosphate limiting conditions. So this is also something that in the future could be transferred into crop plants to see how we can be altering the way that plants perceive the phosphate that's available and acquire the phosphate that's available in the environment um, to influence their growth. And then the last thing I want to mention is a collaboration that we've had with uh, Wijin Ma's group at, uh, at Murdoch University. So they've been looking at um, uh, a silent glutenin um, in wheat. So actually expressing this silent glutenin, which they've done through an integration process, um, can actually increase the wheat grain protein content. And what we've been able to show in collaborations with them is that this is actually reshaping the grain proteome. So what we've discovered is that the impact that we see in these plants isn't just the increase in this particular protein they're adding back, um, but it's actually causing a lack of degradation of other wheat grain proteins as the grains mature. The net effect of this is a 10% increase in wheat grain protein content uh, in field trials without a loss of grain yield. This is an example of where these energy costs um, are being mitigated to increase grain uh, protein content without affecting uh, the yield of the plants themselves. So what's actually next then? These are all capabilities, pretty much all of these have been done without any genetic manipulation. And we can actually think about stacking these because they're largely additive traits. So we could start thinking about taking things from the energy generation side of the equation and the transport and storage cost side of the equation and combining them together in a way that we may be able to alter those pies I was showing you before between photosynthesis and respiratory need in plants. The other thing, of course, is actually exploring future opportunities. As Pam was saying, we're looking at all of these actually at the moment, actually largely within the species that we're studying. Um, but there's a much wider gene bank germplasm which is available, which could further extend what's possible um, in improving these traits. And indeed, as we look further beyond that, synthetic biology will be offering us opportunities to actually break those efficiency boundaries even further by taking a different approach. I was lucky enough to attend a, a meeting a couple of years ago, looking at how synthetic biology might be able to change agriculture in the future. And this was involved 40 research leaders across the world, many of which I met for the first time, thinking about how their particular area in biology could be impacted by the potential of synthetic biology. One of the things that came out of that, uh, that meeting was discussion about uh, uh, carbon assimilation into biomass and the recognition that in plants, we operate with two plant systems, um, but there are six systems in bacterial uh, systems that could be used for CO2 assimilation. And indeed there's about 28 synthetic processes which have been proposed, um, which could also be used to increase CO2 assimilation into biomass. And so you have to really start asking the question, well, what about other um, metabolic processes of interest? What else could be done um, to actually influence this and influence metabolism? And so I really, I think there is a challenge for plant scientists to think about naming the opportunities there are, uh, ranking their status and working to make them more actionable, taking those concepts, trying to convert them into proven possibilities and then work towards the commercial realities of making them possible. At that meeting, there was lots of things discussed about potential um, components that could be altered in plants. And interestingly, many of those, those components ultimately are a question of changing the energy efficiency of the plant system that we're looking at. So really, I think the future is about understanding these biological mechanisms um, that underpin large scale efficiency limits, considering whether or not 
changing individual things can actually work or whether there are environmental and management factors, which means that they need to be modified in different ways. But also thinking about new molecular processes we could introduce to plants to help reimagine the energy efficiency boundaries um, that we have at the moment. So all the work I presented today actually comes from across the network of labs in Australia in plant energy biology. And these are the individual scientists who lead those groups. So they and their collaborators um, have been instrumental into the work that I've just been showing you um, right now. Thank you, Harvey. That was a wonderful um, presentation uh, that introduced uh, a, a broad range of, of um, candidates that are exciting possibilities. We've had uh, not many questions coming in yet. However, um, one, one uh, question from Am Amarjit Tanda was, do you have any insights in how you could improve fruit quality and yield? So most of your talk was really on cereals. And I guess um, presumably the techniques can be applied uh, to horticultural crops. Yeah, look, many of them could be, but we haven't pursued that. So I guess we, we don't have any good examples of where the approaches we've, we've taken could be applied um, to fruit. But in fact, what we're really talking about is just this relationship between photosynthetic processes and respiratory processes. So these would be true for many different plant structures and organs, but you'd have to try um, and look at particular components that because they will be probably unique for different plants and for the different organs that are being harvested as a product. We have another question from Yong Li Li, um, who is interested in to know more about the machine learning work with CIMIT. Hmm. So this is, um, again, what we're doing is collecting very large data sets on what's happening in uh, rates of photosynthetic processes, um, rates of um, respiratory processes, metabolites and proteins. And we've been using random forest decision trees to actually build, um, I guess, an algorithm out of that to define what we can call energy use efficiency for a particular line, because it's not always the same thing. So you actually find that different components of that will be contributing to the high yield of a particular line that you might find in a panel. So that's the approach we've been taking. Um, to make these um, possible on a larger scale, we've been trying to convert these, these biochemical numbers we have into things we might be able to measure with hyperspectral imaging so that we can actually look at larger panels with something that we can define as energy use efficiency. So we have a question that was sort of related from Anoma Ranangalaga. Sorry if I've pronounced your name incorrectly. And do you have any focus on nitrogen use efficiency? We haven't been directly doing, John, you should be able to answer that question. Um, yeah, we, so we haven't been doing work specifically on nitrogen use efficiency, but clearly it's another major area that we could be, um, that we could be working in, yes. Well, just to push it back again to you, I mean, you gave the example of what, what you called a silent glutenin. I'm not quite yep. sure what you mean by a silent glutenin. Oh, so this is one, this is, um, there's one um, glutenin uh, on chromosome 1A, which actually uh, is large, usually silent in most um, uh, commercial bread wheats. So you have to hunt around um, to actually find particular versions of it, which are actually functional. And so there's been a functional version found in some Italian um, wheat lines that have been integrated into Australian commercial lines. And then you can activate effectively, you can turn on that gene and get, get product actually made from that particular um, uh, glutenin. So you might think that, well, there's already another five. So what's, it, what's the sixth actually doing? Obviously it's adding a little bit more protein, but what we found is that its main effect is actually altering the abundance of other proteins, not itself. So um, you said there was, I think, a 10% increase in the protein content of the grain. That's right. Yeah. So does that, does that mean the crop has taken up more nitrogen or more nitrogen has been um, redistributed into the grain at harvest? Um, it seems that there's more nitrogen that has been distributed into the grain at harvest. That seems to be the effect that they're seeing, yeah. Uh, so we're getting quite a lot of questions on GMO crops, which I think I'm going to hold over until till the end. 
Um, so we have a question from Zulian Louis. Could you please elaborate on how environment and management have influenced energy use efficiency and how could synthetic biology address this? That's a big question. Um, I think what we have, we've not so much been actually um, uh, looking at, at the, the environment and management questions directly to understand what components they actually play. More, more our question has been, are the biological factors that we see, can they actually break through and influence what's happening in yield in a field? Because often the case is that a lot of processes in the genetics might be quite functional in, in, in a laboratory sense or in a glasshouse sense, but because of those are questions of how things interact with the environment or how they interact with management means that you don't actually see that benefit in the field. So I guess we've been largely looking at them, recognizing that not everything that we find as a biological factor may actually be useful because of those other factors. We haven't been looking um, at how you might be able to manage energy use efficiency and change it itself using, um, the, using environmental factors or, um, uh, or management factors. So we have a, a question from Nicholas Blanco, uh, who congratulates you on an excellent talk. But he was wondering, this will pain you, uh, do you think that better energy use efficiency could be achieved by plants avoiding mitochondrial contribution to the energy balance? Yeah, look, I mean, at a fundamental level, I think many people thought this for a long time. Actually, just to breed plants that respired slowly might actually be the answer. Um, the difficulty is that plants need to respire if they have that energy energetic requirement for the processes. So the challenge is if you want plants that respire slower, it, it needs to be because they need less of the products of respiration actually to grow. And that's really the challenge what we're looking at. So, so just, you can certainly have mitochondrial mutants and therefore the that, um, respiration will be slower, but normally plant growth is slower as a result. So it's not just a question of changing the, the rate of the process, it's, it's a question of changing the costs. And so that's what we've been focusing on. All right, there's a question from David Argentino, uh, Tenu. Uh, do you have any idea how increasing energy use efficiency would add to product yield, but not being shunted into other plant areas? So yeah, I guess this is the question of really this um, inevitable question of how do you actually make sure um, that you've got a strong enough sink, right, in what you're going to harvest um, to make use of those energy efficiency gains. Um, and there's a lot of people working on this, actually thinking about how we can, needing to be modifying things right across the chain from production right through to the draw in to um, particular products. Um, so yeah, I don't have a particular strategy of, of, of how to do that. And we've largely been looking at whether or not if we influence things um, and the expression of genes actually in the, in the grain, for example, in, or in the product that we want, um, that we can influence it by that point of expression of the particular process you're looking at. But if you're looking at broad effects, which happen in a leaf, of course, there's no guarantee that those effects are going to be shunted into a greater grain yield at the end. All right, so the questions are continuing to roll in. Thank you. Um, I'll hold the rest of the questions uh, until after um, at, at the end, uh, but please keep entering them so we can uh, process them. So thank you, Harvey. We now move on to the third and final uh, presentation from Professor Furbank. Uh, he is from the ARC Center of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis. Bob has been applying his research on photosynthesis in C3 and C4 plants in a crop context, linking genomics, phenomics, and synthetic biology for crop improvement. His talk is titled Photons to Food, boosting photosynthesis to improve food crop yields. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, John. I'll uh, just fire up my talk. Oops, okay, good. Well, thanks, John, for introducing my talk. Um, uh, it's been fortunate really coming uh, last in the series because it's enabled me to avoid some of the introductory slides that would have uh, sopped up a large proportion of my 20 minutes. But uh, what I'd like to do um, uh, in the course of this presentation is something a bit similar to what um, Harvey has done. And that is to uh, introduce uh, 
the uh, reasons why uh, photosynthetic improvements become a major focus uh, in crop physiology and, and plant breeding. Um, use a few vignettes from the uh, Centre of Excellence um, projects uh, in terms of how we're making some progress towards um, application of uh, those strategies. Uh, and then lastly, pr produce a bit of a vision of uh, how we can bring together the genome phenome space uh, and uh, synthetic biology to accelerate our progress in photosynthetic improvement and drill into some more specific examples um, in terms of uh, what Harvey had spoken about uh, on that uh, area. <clears throat> So uh, I would normally have a suite of slides with graphs like Harvey was talking about, some uh, showing how uh, we're falling way short of uh, our annual yield progress we need to get to uh, to feed nine to 10 million, uh, billion people by uh, 2050. But um, instead I'm showing this uh, lovely old painting by Bruegel, which is uh, close to 500 years old. And I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. One is, um, it was almost a logo for us um, uh, that um, when um, we set up the International Wheat Yield Consortium uh, with Matthew Reynolds and Simmet and various other collaborators uh, more than a decade ago, and it, it kind of puts us in touch with the past uh, in a period where uh, people were very much connected to their food production system. Uh, a bad season meant hunger uh, and many people were involved in agriculture, but I also like it because it, it's almost an allegory for uh, how we are currently uh, uh, treating climate change and um, food security. There's a few people working away madly there, harvesting. There's a guy asleep who's probably a politician in today's environment, and then a bunch of people who are still having lunch. So um, uh, that kind of uh, strikes at the heart of, uh, of where we need to go with uh, addressing food security. But the subtitle of this, I guess, is a statement made by um, the CEO of CSIRO, where I was back in 2009 when we started our plant phenomics uh, centre in Canberra. And I guess this means much more to journalists and the general public than uh, graphs do. And that was the statement that in the next 50 years, we'll have to produce more food than we have consumed in the history of humankind. Um, and that's a big statement. Um, but um, what that does uh, is it focuses us on, focuses our thoughts on the future. And uh, I think we can't afford to do that. We've already had a major food, food crisis uh, globally back in 2008, 2009, uh, where world um, uh, global supplies um, and stocks of um, harvest, harvested grain, uh, in the case of wheat, dropped to 30 days of, uh, of global consumption. And we saw rice prices double in the space of one year. So. These kind of statements and the graphs, I guess, don't really capture the immediacy uh, of the problem. But why has photosynthesis become such a popular topic? Well, uh, we've had uh, a couple of um, uh, mentions already of Norman Borlaug and the pioneering work that was done in the uh, 60s and 70s in the so-called Green Revolution. And this was the last time that we saw some massive increases in um, cereal grain yields globally. Uh, on the back of uh, pioneering work on disease resistance, of course, but also um, uh, the introduction of dwarfing genes uh, to wheat and to rice. And basically what these dwarfing genes did was to reallocate carbon uh, between or away from uh, structural biomass uh, and towards harvestable grain. So uh, this dwarfing gene um, uh, breeding actually changed the harvest index, the proportion of the crop which was harvestable grain. So when we look at this, uh, the yield equation, as um, uh, Harvey touched on it, it's a fairly simple equation. Um, yield is basically biomass multiplied by the proportion of that biomass that's uh, harvestable um, product, harvest index. And the biomass is made up by uh, the absorbed radiation by the efficiency with which that radiation is converted uh, into biomass. So the radiation use efficiency uh, component uh, includes the um, energy use efficiency that um, Harvey was talking about, uh, but also there is a component of that energy use efficiency in the harvest index component. But what I'll be focusing on is radiation use efficiency in this, um, in this um, uh, talk. So what we've seen uh, uh, during this period of uh, recent um, uh, stagnation of yield gain in our major cereal crops 
is now being put down to um, harvest index and grain number reaching an, uh, an asymptote. Largely, those gains are being exhausted in global plant breeding programs. And that was seen as early as the late 90s and early 2000s uh, in rice breeding and more recently in, in wheat. Uh, the harvest index um, or the genetic potential for harvest index in many of our cereal crops is now around 0.6, which is the theoretical maximum. And we're seeing in rice in particular that we can produce more available florets than we can actually fill. So there's not enough photosynthetic push. Uh, there aren't enough solar panels to produce the energy to fill those batteries. So what we've seen over the last decade is a large investment on photosynthetic improvement in our cereal crops. Uh, we've seen that um, uh, we've seen an investment of um, hundreds of millions of dollars if we add up all of these initiatives. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have invested heavily in uh, introducing uh, C4 photosynthetic process into rice, uh, which kicked off back in 2009. Um, the RIPE investment through the University of Illinois and a global consortium to increase photosynthetic efficiency. Um, a number of different programs which have as a component of them uh, improving photosynthetic performance, including the International Wheat Yield Partnership, and of course our photosynthesis center. So back in 2013, um, uh, we uh, were successful in putting up a proposal to the same scheme that the uh, Plant Energy Biology um, Center was funded under, the IRC Centers of Excellence. And um, the IRC Center of Excellence in Translational Photosynthesis was born. Um, this center is a collaboration um, between Australian National University, University of Queensland, University of Sydney, University of Western Sydney, CSIRO, partnering with the International Rice Research Institute and more recently with CIMIT uh, in wheat. And the object of this center was to span from the leaf to the field. So to build on our strong basic science around photosynthesis and translate that uh, into improved crop yield. With the major target crops uh, in this process being uh, rice, wheat, sorghum, and more recently canola. This investment was around $25 million of government money, which we've more than matched um, from other sources. So what are the research strategies in this center? Um, as I said, we've, we've been working on photosynthesis for a long time and Australia has a, a strong background in um, basic uh, strategic research in photosynthesis. So we call this our research flower. So we're basically structured around four programs. Program one, uh, improving CO2 fixation um, through uh, Rubisco evolution and engineering. Um, aquaporin CO2 porins for introducing CO2 more effectively into the leaf, um, also CO2 concentrating mechanisms, um, including bicarbonate trans translocators and also uh, the C4 mechanism. Uh, in increased light conversion, of course, uh, we're working on uh, improving the spectrum of light that's being absorbed by the plant and how that light's being utilized. Uh, in program three, we're exploiting the natural variation in photosynthetic processes. And in program four, uh, we're modeling how those photosynthetic improvements might be transferred into yield. So what I'll do today is to concentrate more uh, on these three aspects. I think Rubisco and uh, CO2 concentrating mechanisms have had a pretty good um, uh, run of it over the past few years. So I'll touch on a couple of vignettes from exploiting natural variation and also um, utilization of light energy more efficiently in crops uh, in this talk and also a tiny bit on, uh, on modeling. So exploiting natural variation, um, uh, when we started this project, uh, really there was not much information around about uh, how much variation in photosynthetic properties there were in crops, in particular in our major crops, uh, grain crops, wheat and rice. And the reason for this is that uh, photosynthetic variation uh, has not been exploited as the traditional ways of measuring it are way too slow. Uh, the traditional uh, way of measuring um, photosynthetic performance is to do gas exchange, which a traditional assimilation versus CO2 response could have, can take up to 20 minutes per measurement. Uh, if we want to measure thousands of lines and look at variation, uh, you could spend your whole life doing gas exchange. But gas exchange is a really informative uh, technique. Um, based on the pioneering models of Farquhar von Cameron Berry from 1980, we know that a simple CO2 assimilation response uh, to CO2 concentration can give us a lot of information about leaf biochemistry. 
can give us how much rubisco is in the leaf, um, uh, the kinetic properties of that rubisco. Uh, it can give us the electron transport rate, how efficiently uh, light's being absorbed and utilized to drive photosynthesis. So the question was, can we use those two parameters, in this case, VC max, uh, which is related to rubisco, and J, which is related to uh, light use? And can we look at those parameters uh, and how those parameters vary across wheat? Uh, and what kind of genetic variation is available? Can we breed for this? Uh, so this came from uh, a PhD program which uh, Viridiana Silva-Perez carried out um, uh, at ANU in collaboration with CIMIT and CSIRO. And she actually went through a large uh, set of three populations across two environments to have a look at what kind of variation was present uh, in these crops. And what she saw uh, was what we were expecting to see to some degree, and that is that uh, the investment in rubisco uh, varies with nitrogen content. The more nitrogen that's there, the more rubisco that is there. This also applies for J for the modeled um, electron transport rate and the capacity for the plant to utilize incoming light energy. So um, uh, that is interesting and but predictable. But what I found most interesting was uh, when we reach agronomic uh, nitrogen application uh, and the agronomically um, relevant nitrogen levels uh, per unit leaf area or per leaf mass, we see a large variation in the amount um, of photosynthetic um, machinery that's present in the leaf. There's around 30% variation uh, around the mean in wheat. And this is across populations that are not so wild and woolly. Some of these uh, are in fact uh, populations of elite lines. We see that there's this 30% variation around the mean uh, and that while photosynthetic capacity follows nitrogen content per leaf area, what we call photosynthetic efficiency, um, uh, which is rubisco activity in amount, can vary quite considerably across genotypes uh, for a given uh, nitrogen level in the leaf. So this is important both in terms of applying photosynthetic variation in breeding programs, but also for nitrogen use efficiency, where we had a question a bit earlier on. So we still were measuring things at that stage using gas exchange. Um, uh, Harvey touched on this uh, technique uh, in his talk. During the course of um, uh, Viri's uh, PhD project and subsequently we've developed uh, some techniques um, where we can look at the light that's being reflected from uh, a leaf or from the canopy. And we can derive a number of traits related to photosynthesis by modeling the reflected wavelengths of light uh, against photosynthetic traits using machine learning. Uh, this is a well-developed technique now, which we have a, uh, um, a web-based application in which we can pump these spectral measurements into our prediction algorithms and come up with six traits related to photosynthetic performance. Uh, this is a big improvement in terms of speed, so 20 seconds per leaf trait. Uh, and we get some very interesting results. So the first question, of course, is um, are these traits heritable? Uh, what proportion of uh, these photosynthetic traits is determined by the uh, genetics of the wheat variety and what proportion is determined by the environment in which they're measured? Uh, and what's the genetic architecture that underpins that uh, genetic variation? So all you need to know about this diagram uh, is that uh, it's a plot of uh, heritability. So a heritability of one is 100% of that uh, measured uh, parameter is determined by genetics. The heritability of zero is that none of it is at all determined by environment. So as we can see here, uh, the more blue the boxes are, the better we get. So the VC max, the rubisco related parameters, the electron transport related parameters, and the investment in photosynthetic machining per nitrogen area are all well um, based in genetics and are highly heritable. So that holds great promise that we can apply those in crop breeding uh, using traditional crossing techniques. But also, can we drill down to what the genes are that underpin uh, these differences we see from the best of the worst photosynthetic performance? So what we've done in the International Wheat Yield Partnership Program is to apply this hyperspectral technique uh, to screen structured populations and, um, uh, and also um, uh, diversity sets. Uh, and we've come up with some interesting QTLs. We've come up with some interesting genomic regions that are highly correlated with the traits that are listed on the right. Uh, J, VC max, uh, VC max per unit N and nitrogen content. So at the moment, we're still processing this data uh, 
uh, and we'll be looking at what genes uh, are present underneath those so-called QTLs, quantitative trait loci. So I'll switch gears now from the um, uh, genetic um, screening and uh, phenome genome uh, um, way of uh, looking at uh, genetic variation to one example of uh, the utilization of our basic science around um, candidate genes uh, in photosynthesis and how we might improve um, plant performance through increasing the amount of these proteins that we know are bottlenecks in, uh, in photosynthetic performance. And this uh, approach has been used extensively, of course, in the right program uh, and, um, uh, and other um, related activities in improving both uh, light performance in plants and carbon uh, fixation performance. So this example is around a protein which is present in the thylakoid um, of uh, C3 and C4 plants, the cytochrome B6F complex. And this is a major bottleneck uh, in uh, electron transport rate between photosystems one and two, particularly pertinent at high light. And the history of this is quite interesting because the discovery that this protein was a major bottleneck um, actually occurred in Canberra back in the 1990s with some pioneering work uh, led by Dean Price, Murray Badger and uh, Susanna on camera, where they showed that uh, reducing the amount of a, um, a, a nuclear encoded protein, the risky iron sulfur protein, which forms a component of this B6F complex, severely limited the amount of electron transport which could occur through that electron transport chain uh, and decrease the plant's performance at high light. Uh, this observation has been carried through by Christine Raines' lab at the University of Essex. And she's shown that by increasing the expression of this uh, risky iron sulfur protein, she could increase the amount of this B6F complex and improve um, photosynthetic electron transport in C3 plants. So what was done uh, by uh, Marsha Umakova and Susanna von Kammerer's lab uh, was to overexpress this um, risky iron sulfur protein uh, in our pet plant, um, Soteri viridis, which is uh, a transformable uh, C4 millet that we use in the lab. We've also been putting that risky iron sulfur protein overexpression construct into sorghum. But in a nutshell, um, what she saw was approximately a 15% improvement in photosynthetic rate at high light. And this is particularly important for C4 plants because they're, they're high light environment crops. Uh, in the case of sorghum, it's grown in a fairly spaced environment. A lot of the leaves are sunlit. Uh, and this is uh, um, quite an important improvement in photosynthetic performance under field conditions. Uh, it's very difficult in Australia to carry out field trials, but um, we're hoping to do some um, uh, mini canopy experiments in controlled environments soon. Uh, to validate the effects of those improvements in photosynthesis on yield. But um, uh, Alex Wu, who's from our University of Queensland node, has modelled this uh, uh, improvement in photosynthesis. And from the model, um, we're expecting up to an 8% increase uh, in grain yield uh, in sorghum as a response to those experiments. And this work was carried out uh, in collaboration with Christine Raines at the University of Essex. So there are two kinds of examples of how we can mine genetic variation. Uh, we can take a targeted um, uh, candidate gene approach uh, to apply our basic science to engineering photosynthesis uh, in crops. But can we bring those two things together? And this is where I think we really have uh, uh, an opportunity to kick some goals uh, over the next decade. Uh, the genome phenome space that I've talked about uh, is important for two reasons. One is we now have the high throughput phenotyping techniques to take large diversity sets, uh, as both Pam and Harvey have indicated. Uh, we now have large collections of germplasm, um, uh, both wild germplasm, land races, uh, and many, many different accessions, uh, which have had high density genotyping across them, even genome resequence. Uh, the Institute for Plant Breeding at um, Gartersleben in Germany has three Illumina platforms working day and night to produce uh, this sequence information uh, for cereals uh, and their wild relatives. So we can mine that information um, by taking some of this material out, doing high throughput screening, uh, looking at uh, statistical correlations between allelic variation uh, and understanding what the genetic architecture is behind that variation. Um, Doing this, then we can generate new candidate genes and transgene targets that can be used in a transgenic approach. Uh, 
But importantly, uh, it provides a rapid way of translating some of this work into crop breeding. So superior material can be used in crosses immediately. We can generate QTLs for marker-assisted selection, uh, and we can improve genome selection models because breeders now not only want to know what a QTL is, they want to know what's underneath it and what the polymorphisms are uh, that are causative for that uh, improvement so they can incorporate it into their genome selection models. Uh, we can also come at this from the genome to phenome side. We can say, well, as photosynthesis researchers or in fact, um, uh, any other kind of plant biology uh, specialization, if we've got a lot of domain, domain knowledge about what the candidates are that would be important for this process, we can look for allelic variation in those candidate genes across these populations. And in some cases, many of these populations have many years of agronomic trait data associated with them. So we can match up allelic variation in candidate genes uh, with plant performance using historical data, which can help us uh, hone um, and decide which are our most important targets for us to engineer. And by combining this approach uh, with synthetic biology, I think we have a great opportunity to accelerate our crop breeding process. So we can take our gene candidates, uh, we can use the um, synthetic biology, learn, design, build, test cycle. Um, we can do this in a, a number of different ways. Uh, one powerful way is through gene editing. If we find some SNPs, some alleles uh, in wild material uh, that appear to be responsible for um, genetic variation in an important trait like photosynthetic performance, we normally would have to cross and cross and cross to get that gene into our elite lines. Now we can make what are called allele mimics. We can edit those genes in our elite material and very rapidly get material into the field. I think this is a major game changer um, for us in, uh, in manipulating photosynthetic processes. Uh, we also have uh, some rapid advances in synthetic promoters, some Golden Gate technology for introducing um, entire metabolic pathways like in C4 rice. Uh, and we're hearing daily about improvements in transformation systems, um, making it possible to do crop transformation uh, even in a research lab. An example of um, one of these major advances, advances in synthetic biology is the utility of these large gene constructs in C4 rice. So to introduce five genes in the C4 rice program, uh, we recently published the results of these experiments. It took six years of crossing of individual transgenic lines uh, to make one particular transgenic line with homozygous um, alleles for those five genes incredibly long process. So this is one of the reasons why single gene transgenics have been um, uh, the method of choice. With Golden Gate cloning uh, and related uh, types of synthetic biology applications, we've been able to phenocopy that, uh, make plants with homozygous um, alleles for five genes in one year. So this is an amazing um, acceleration of our transgenic crop breeding uh, uh, process. So my last slide, can we go fast enough uh, to get there? Um, I'm confident that we can, and I wanna finish on a, a, an optimistic note. It's been pretty hard to be optimistic in 2020. But when I look around the world at um, the next generation of, um, of plant science um, researchers, I see a lot of young people uh, who are keen not only to do the greatest science that they can achieve, but also to apply that science in a translational context to crops. I don't see too many people lying around uh, taking a snooze. Uh, so I'm optimistic about the future and I'm optimistic that we can bring together um, traditional breeding, uh, genome phenome biology and um, uh, synthetic biology to accelerate uh, photosynthetic improvement and plant performance uh, to feed the world by 2050. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, a large number of people in this. Uh, so I thought it was easiest just to put a picture of uh, our annual meeting uh, of all of the uh, people uh, in our Centre of Excellence and uh, assemble the um, photographs of the collaborators uh, whose um, results I've used in this particular presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, it's actually a nice, um, end to your talk to think of the speeding up that uh, introduction of the Golden Gate methodology has uh, 
has led because of course Borlaug one of the things that he did in the green revolution was to introduce uh, two breeding cycles per year and double the speed of genetic progress. Uh, so now you've given a, a lovely a modern example of how uh, improvements continue to be made uh, in terms of uh, facilitating breeding. So um, again, I'm calling for questions from the floor uh, before we open it up to a more general discussion. So maybe um, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, one of the advantages of the reflectance uh, methodology, of course, is, is an optical signal. Do you want to speculate how that can be applied um, from um, UAVs or, uh, or, or higher flying platforms? Yeah, the, uh, one of the limitations at the moment with the instrument that we've been using um, uh, is that uh, it's expensive and it measures uh, on a single leaf. So um, even though it only takes 20 seconds, it's still not really fast enough uh, for breeders. Um, we grow uh, out, uh, this image behind me at the moment is an example of, uh, uh, of field trials uh, for wheat varieties. So each one of those plots is about 10 square metres. A million of those plots get grown out every year in Australia just for wheat breeding. So uh, extending this to drones uh, to, in, in the end, to satellites um, is really essential uh, to do really high throughput um, work in the breeding system. So um, I think as we get more affordable aerial sensors, um, we can use those. Uh, but in the meantime, we've been working with improved machine learning algorithms to allow us to narrow the wavelengths that we have to measure to get good predictions. And we've been, um, uh, quite successful in that. So we're confident that we can scale this uh, to imaging. And a large amount of work's also going on uh, in places like Brookhaven in Illinois uh, in this area to extend to uh, image-based data. All right, so we have a talk, uh, a question, sorry, from Ian Wright, who is interested that the heritability for a complex trait leaf mass per area is much greater than that for Rubisco. And he was wondering whether you'd like to speculate why that might be. Yeah, well, the heritability of leaf mass per area and um, uh, these structural traits seems to be quite high. And I think one of the, well, John can probably answer this better than me, actually, but um, uh, we found that um, uh, quite again and again, really, that structural traits um, are more heritable than our photosynthetic traits. And one reason is that in the photosynthetic traits, really, we're trying to look at rates. Uh, so um, when we're looking at a structural trait, it's the amount of something. So um, for instance, VC, Max and J, uh, they're not just the amount uh, of that protein, uh, they're the rate at which that protein is operating in the plant. So that is potentially why uh, the structural traits are more heritable than the photosynthetic traits per se. They're less, uh, they're, the structural traits are less sensitive to uh, environmental effects. Did you want to add to that, John? Uh, sorry, I'm I'm sort of triaging the questions at the same time, so I'll I'll <laughs> I'll pass on that. <laughs> Thanks. Right. Um, I guess, but just uh, to add, I guess one of the one of the issues is is uh, being able to measure the leaf mass per area. Of course, is quite um, robust and precise, whereas measuring rubisco activity um, has a, has a greater uncertainty. So that would uh, possibly. Uh, contribute to a lower heritability. Uh, if we, the better that we can actually characterize the rubisco activity, then probably the, that would improve our heritability estimate. But of course, um, getting a very tight estimate of rubisco activity is a slow process. So that makes it not amenable for doing the um, heritability assay. <laughs> So I have a very long question here from Valdir Moreira, uh, which uh, if you'll allow me to read it out. Um, and I guess part of it, you covered Bob in your, your C4 Rice um, Gates um, part of the talk. So, but during years, so many research groups gathered efforts to convert plants with C3 metabolics into C4. Um, should we give uh, more attention to give, uh, to continue using this same strategy or is there an alternative? And how about using it in metabolic engineering? Other groups demonstrated using operons uh, transformed tobacco plastids um, and transgenic plants to improve the photosynthetic process. So do you know something related to that could be applied to agronomic plants? In Brazil, we've gathered many efforts to use the technique, but um, can they be translated to, to soybean and cotton, for example? 
And okay. finally, uh, what about resistance to high temperature? Sorry, big mouthful there. Mm. Well, the C4 pathway engineering uh, is an interesting one. Um, uh, when um, uh, RIPE kicked off and also our center, um, uh, quite a big effort was put into uh, bicarbonate transporters, for example, as a way of bumping up the CO2 concentration in the chloroplast. And it was thought that maybe this would be more simple than putting in uh, up to 20 genes is what we're trying to do in C4 rice, um, which I think it now is achievable with um, Golden Gate cloning at maybe too low side. But um, it's turned out that getting bicarbonate transporters to work uh, in plants is almost as difficult as getting all the C4 enzymes and, uh, uh, and anatomical specialization. So, uh, and chloroplast transformation is an interesting one. Uh, I mean, yes, chloroplast transformation is a great solution, but so far, it's not really very achievable in our major crop species. There's been some success in soybean, I think, but no success thus far that I'm aware of in our cereal crops. So uh, that's a, a tricky one. And in terms of heat tolerance, yes, um, there's quite a bit of work going on in the centre too, in collaboration with the Energy Biology Centre um, uh, around heat and drought tolerance. Um, but yeah, I didn't really have time to touch on that. But yes, the, the capacity to stack some of the photosynthetic improvements uh, together uh, with these other traits, um, I think is afforded by these new synthetic biology technologies and it's an incredibly exciting time, I think. All right, we have a question from Victor Sadras, uh, who is asking about um, the bottlenecks. Um, do you think it's, uh, oops, it's just dropped out of my screen. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, it's basically, is, is uh, the breeding or the, the molecular biology more the limitation? Where's the bottleneck? Uh, well, um, all right, uh, Victor uh, and I have talked about this before. It's um, seven to 10 years to get to breed a new wheat variety. And um, I've been through and tried to do a business case on uh, if you could, how much you could compress that with, with molecular techniques and, and high throughput phenomics. And at that stage, you could maybe take a year off the breeding cycle. So yes, there are some major constraints at the moment. Uh, which we can't avoid, like how to bulk up enough seed for a, for a new variety. But um, also there are things like the, the rate at which we can um, uh, achieve sufficient genetic progress in our breeding system. So uh, genome selection and high quality um, phenomics tools to screen germplasm, I think um, will make a big difference. So bringing together the molecular biology to produce material that could be used in crossing programs, particularly in areas where we can't develop enough trait space, enough variation to do uh, traditional breeding. Um, I think that's probably the answer. So that's not really answering Victor's question, but uh, I think, yes, there are limitations in breeding we can't overcome at the moment, um, uh, but I think that some of them can be addressed through uh, these new technologies. All right, I just will give you one more question before I uh, open it to the previous speakers as well. So this question comes from Wallace Cowling. How does the Australian photosynthesis work differ uh, to the work of Don Ort and colleagues in the USA? Yeah, well, in two ways, I guess, um, uh, that um, where we've been um, uh, concentrating uh, half of our activities um, uh, more in a, um, a genome phenome component where we've been looking at genetic variation, that so far hasn't formed a large part of uh, the RIPE activities. But there's also a lot of crossover between RIPE and the center activities because many of our CIs are also involved in RIPE. Um, uh, people like Susanna Von Camera and, uh, and Dean Price. So the activities are synergistic. Um, also the work in terms of the crops are quite different. So the Gates Foundation's key crops are, are rice, cowpea um, and cassava because these are the crops that are relevant to sub-Saharan Africa. So our focus uh, has been more on crops that are relevant to Australian uh, agriculture. So some of our targets have been different. Uh, our focus on, um, uh, on looking at um, uh, genetic variation as well as the transgenic approach is a little bit different. So um, uh, that's really where our points of difference lie. 
All right, thank you, Bob. So I'd like to uh, int uh, get Harvey and Pamela to put their microphones back on so we can rejoin the, the panel discussion. And maybe I'll kick off with that firstly with a question I've been holding over, and there's actually been several versions of it, uh, which is about genetically engineered or genetically modified organisms. And there was one question about uh, rice. Uh, is that currently um, a genetically modified rice? I know of golden rice, um, but maybe Pamela, are you aware of other other uh, rice that have been engineered? Are they available in the US or released in the US, for example? I don't think there's any genetically engineered rice on the market that's been approved. There, BT rice was released to farmers through breeding stations in China, but then it was um, removed from the hands of, of farmers. So I don't think there is any rice available yet. And golden rice is still not in the hands of farmers. It's been approved um, for consumption by many countries, but it's still uh, not in the hands of farmers. And of course, the whole concept of genetically modified organism is uh, a changing landscape with the advent of genetic engineering with CRISPR-Cas9. Um, there is a diversity in legislation differing, for example, in North America from Europe, uh, and Australia has recently changed its uh, regulatory environment in that space. So gene editing is possible to introduce uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which would be like a natural occurring mutation event. Um, but the genetically modified uh, term is being retained for when there's an introduction of foreign DNA. It depends what country you're in. So the FDA, uh, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States does not use the term GMO because it's so confusing. It stands for genetically modified organism and everything we eat is genetically altered in some manner. So they don't, they don't use that. So that term is not used in the United States. Um, so what's, you know, there's regulated or not regulated. So essentially, if you have a gene from a bacteria um, into a plant, that, that's going to be regulated, like the BT trait. But if it's marker-assisted breeding or um, brought in from a wild species uh, or genome edited, that's not regulated uh, in the United States, at least at, that, at this moment. All right. Um, so let me think. Um, I suppose uh, just more generally, though, uh, if we think about our GM, GMOs or uh, genetically edited plants, are, are they going to be publicly accepted? And I think that space is definitely changing through time. Uh, I always make a point in my lectures to undergraduates of asking, are there any concerns that the, the, the students have? And I find that the, the younger audiences tend not to be concerned. Um, and given that the technology is continuing to evolve, uh, I think there is a growing acceptance certainly here in Australia. And I think uh, with TJ Higgins recently gave a talk on introduction of GM uh, uh, cowpea into, into Africa. Uh, so there's uh, acceptance and, and desire to actually have access to uh, that avenue uh, of, of crop improvement um, on that continent. Uh, so there was a, a question, maybe I'll come back to you, Harvey, about um, micronutrients. So are you um, considering the, uh, how you would manipulate micronutrients uh, and for nutritional enhancement of, of grains? So I, I try to write an answer to that, basically saying I don't know enough about it. Um, but uh, I, I think it's um, uh, it depends where, where where the edge of the micronutrients are. But clearly, there is going to be a link between the content of micronutrients and what kind of end products are being made um, on macronutrients. So if you imagine um, improvements in cereal yield, which often are happening, which are simply starch improvements then this is going to produce a lower quality. We have a lot of quality trait issues. If you manage and maintain the protein and starch content in cereals, then I think there will be some knock-on consequences for micronutrients just because of what's involved in actually building and maintaining um, proteins as, as a major end product in cereals. But there's clearly a lot of other um, micronutrients which 
won't necessarily be retained if you start moving around some of those mo major macronutrients that are in, in cereals. So, um, so you can, thinking about iron content and other things, which are obviously major issues and people are working specifically to try to maintain and manage and improve and increase those. Yet I haven't seen much of an interconnection between people who are doing that and people who are working on metabolism of cereals themselves. But there clearly will be connections. So I think it's an area of, of research that needs to be done. And clearly it's something that needs to be kept in mind. If improvements are being made, then we can't be doing that at the expense of the micronutrients, which are gonna be critical for people's um, uh, nutrition all around the world. Could I make a comment on that, John, as well? Certainly. There was some uh, work done uh, last year on um, uh, an analysis of, I think, 10 years worth of free air CO2 enrichment work in rice, which suggested that um, uh, improved photosynthesis or high CO2 treatment of rice might dilute nutrient content. And that was definitely the case, but there seemed to be genetic variation in how the rice lines responded to that. So some rice genotypes um, with improved um, yield as a response to CO2 enrichment diluted their nutrients and micronutrients and some didn't. So that kind of gave me some hope that uh, uh, we could come to a compromise. Uh, so a question has just come in on uh, whether anyone would like to comment on nitrogen use efficiency, photosynthetic nitrogen use efficiency in sugarcane. Uh, is there work on that? So Bob, I guess in the case of the Soteria um, transformation, uh, th that technology could be applied to uh, sugarcane as well as sorghum. Yeah, well, C4 is um, uh, in terms of intrinsic nitrogen use efficiency uh, performed better than C3s. And that's one of the drivers for putting C4 in a rice, but uh, mainly due to the reduced investment in rubisco, of course. Um, but the issues with sugarcane, uh, uh, I mean, I think, well, I don't want to be too controversial about this, but um, uh, my interaction with sugarcane farmers um, revolved around uh, the inappropriate application of nitrogen at the wrong time of the year. Some of my colleagues up there who were farming sugarcane liked to put all their nitrogen on at the beginning of the year so they could go out in their fishing boat for a while uh, and then come back and harvest the crop. So it really wasn't a biological issue per se it was a management or agronomy issue so um but you know having better utilization of leaf nitrogen um in terms of it, the photosynthetic proteins uh, would improve nitrogen use efficiency both in uh in the c3 cereals and also uh in sugarcane but i suspect um to be hard-headed about it uh, the major problems at least in australia revolve around agronomy not um, genetics in my view yeah, one of, the, of course, unintended consequences of improving the nitrogen efficiency, the photosynthetic nitrogen efficiency, uh, is that you still need that nitrogen in the plant to be transferred to the grain uh, to, to build the protein. Um, so if, if you've suddenly got photosynthesis occurring with half the amount of nitrogen, uh, you've still got to store or take up that nitrogen um, uh, so that it's able to be transported and put into that increased grain. So they're quite tricky compromises. <clears throat> so there's a question, another question from Kathleen Hefferon. Uh, this one, I guess, is for you, Pamela. What are your thoughts about gene drive to reduce insect pathogens of plants? Um, yeah, I think that's pretty exciting. There's entomologists working on this. Um, I'm afraid I don't know too much about it, but I think there's no reason it, it, it shouldn't work for certain insects. Um, as we know, there's been a lot of work um, uh, reducing um, Zika and other insect um, um, transmitted diseases for human populations. So I think certainly there's a lot of promise uh, for, for plant pests as well. And maybe a couple of the other, any of you know a little bit more about that perhaps? So the idea is if you can get rid of the insect vector, then you're going to have less of the disease. 
So actually, Kathleen has, a, has another question I overlooked, um, which was basically if you engineer uh, microbes to assist crops, uh, and they're, they're genetically modified and associated with the crop, does that uh, transfer a worry to the farmer in terms of uh, restrictions in their sale of the, of the crop? I'm not aware of any uh, GMO microbes actually being used agronomically. Well, the very first uh, anti-GMO uh, protest was for the ice minus bacteria in Berkeley of Steve Lindau. Uh, so they had uh, essentially created a, a deletion mutant and they wanted to test it on strawberry plants and it, it was highly regulated. Uh, so I think that will continue to be the case. I don't think you have to label the plant as, as regulated, but if, if you're going to um, genetically engineer a, a microbe, then I think at this point it, it would be regulated, at least in the United States. Yes, I'd forgotten about that ice protein. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. <clears throat> I, perhaps I could make a comment, it's not related to microbes, but it's related more to the uh, ease of transforming plants. And um, I mean, a recent paper from Dan Voitis um, showed that uh, you could transform meristems um, uh, plants uh, with gene editing constructs and then um, harvest seed from those plants uh, without any tissue culture that contained the edit, but not the Cas9 um, gene. So, with absolutely no evidence that the plant had been edited. So I kind of think this is the beginning of do-it-yourself gene editing. And uh, if it becomes so easy to do, um, I think it could be a nightmare to try and regulate. So anyway, that's an interesting um, way things are going. I don't, I don't know what you think about that, Pam. Do you, are you aware of this paper? Yeah. I am. That's a very interesting paper. I, well, in the United States, it wouldn't be edited anyway, if you can segregate out the Cas9. And, and I thought in, at least in one state in Australia, genome edited crops are not going to be regulated. Is, is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's only counted um, as genetically modified if foreign uh, DNA is introduced or is non- Is that in all uh, states? Non -host uh, so no, there is variation between states. So that's the national regulator, but uh, on oh. top of that, then there's state uh, legislation. So South Australia, for example, has been um, anti or banned GM uh, farming options until recently. If, if there's a template involved in the um, uh, reforming, then it is also considered to be a GM. So um, it's, yeah, in Australia. Uh, so we have a have a question. Oh, a couple have come through. Let me see. It's great to have so many questions. So thanks to the audience. Uh, so I have a question from Miguel um, Hernandez uh, Prieto. Is what's the biggest effect the pandemic has had on research this year? Discouragement, depression. <laughs> Now, I should say that, well, all of us, I think probably people in the audience too, had to, you know, shut down the labs. A lot of people have been, haven't been able to go to work. So there's been a huge setback in research, I, I think, around the globe. And I think it's been challenging for people because scientists are social animals. And so if you come to work and only half your lab mates are allowed to be there. It's, it's been challenging. So I, I mean, we still see that in the United States, you're in a lot better shape in Australia and other places in the world, but it's definitely um, almost all the projects I've been involved in in the United States have taken um, quite a hit in productivity. So Harvey, do you want to comment on, well, okay. West Australia is such an isolated place. We have, I mean, I guess the main effect for us has been, or and I know this from speaking to other people in other countries where they haven't had a major local um, problem but the, the lack of being able to, to travel and interact with other scientists can be also, it may not have the immediate effect, but it's gonna have a long-term effect on what sort of collaborations are actually being built. Because a lot of these larger consortium that people are involved in come, come from physical interactions and talking with people. And if you're 
just relying on, on, on Zoom and other resources, even though that's a great level as well, it actually provides a lot of opportunity for people to interact who otherwise wouldn't be able to attend meetings, for example. Um, so there are some advantages of that, I think that have happened as, as well. But clearly, I think for many people who do often travel, um, this has limited what they feel they can do and the sort of connections that they think they can be making for the future. Yes, so um, I think certainly the Zoom and the, and the international opportunities through online interaction have really been enhanced uh, through COVID. So I think many opportunities have actually become more, more possible uh, despite the local difficulties and, and the lack of travel. Obviously conferences are, are gonna have to be reinvented possibly for still some time into the future. I would like to probably close um, the, the questions here and once again return to the fact that our three speakers were all very upbeat about the, the exciting opportunities and the rapid progress that is, is really being made possible in, in plant science. And what we need is to encourage the youth to um, embrace the field and enter the field and contribute. The field benefits from input from professional as well as academics and there are many opportunities. Of course, there's always the challenge of tenure and, and continuity in funding, and we're always struggling. We always would like to have more money, but obviously the more we can proselytize and persuade the funding institutions, the public and the politicians, um, that's um, going to help. But we all eat. We are all faced with a growing world population that we need to uh, produce uh, food for. We all have a personal responsibility in our consumption to reduce waste and what we consume. Uh, that influences what is grown. There's a massive uh, increasing trajectory on the consumption of meat worldwide. Um, and while some countries possibly don't eat enough um, and other countries eat too much, that places a toll on, on the earth's ability to, to provide that food. So while individually we can all take action, um, I think also collectively, uh, there is great possibilities. And I'd like to thank Pamela and Harvey and Bob for very informative talks, keeping to time and dealing with the diversity of questions. And I'd like to thank the audience uh, from so many diverse places. I haven't been able to see everywhere, but we've certainly had participants from many different continents. Uh, and the talks will be posted, uh, they've been recorded, they will be posted online in the next couple of days. Thank you, John. Yeah, thanks, thank John. You, John. Thank you for this excellent moderation. I mean, thank you all for joining. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.